inviting me to share today about one of my favorite psalms and also just to share in this uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, thank you so much. I don't know if you know this, but we no longer live in San Francisco. We've moved to Fresno. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for the past month and a half, we've been there every single day, and it's uh, been a hundred, over a hundred every day. So coming back to the Bay Area has been refreshment, not only <laughs> uh, spiritually, but also physically. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, and would you join me in prayer as we invite the Holy Spirit to uh, speak to each one of our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Padre Celestial, Tú eres Santo. Dear Heavenly Father, you are holy. We thank you. We are not worthy to be called yours, but you call us your sons. Somos hijos, tus hijos y hijas. Thank you, Lord. Qué gran privilegio que tenemos. What a great privilege we have just to be called your own. Lord, thank you for each and one of my brothers and sisters here. I pray that you'd be glorified as we connect to you, to ourselves, to each other, and to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, the title of my sermon today, well, really just me sharing my heart with you today, is called Todo de Mi, All of Me. I don't know if you could see that. And the passage that was just read, it was wonderful to hear it both in Spanish and English. It's, bendice alma mía al Señor, a Jehová. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, bless, bless the Lord, all my soul. Many times we focus on the idea of blessing. Uh, many times we, we talk about uh, the idea of the soul, but what I want to encourage us to do is to think about um, all, the all part. What does it mean to bless the Lord with all of your soul, all of it? So todo de mí, all of me. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I want to introduce you to my family. This is my family of origin, so that's my great-grandmother, um, Modesta, right there on the far right. And there she is with my grandpa in her hand. So that's the side of my family that uh, crossed the border into the United States. That's my dad's part of the family, the Magallanes family. And underneath, they are the mestizos or the mixed people that the border crossed them for five generations. There we have people in New Mexico, Arizona, New Mexico border, uh, mixed Spaniard and Navajo Indian mestizos, and that's my grandma Josie. And this is her great grandmother right here, in, right under my abuelita modesta, my bisabuela. So for me, Hispanic Heritage Month is not just a celebration of where my father came from, but it's also a celebration of being a, having an American heritage. So in 1810, uh, this territory that we're, st we're standing on was still a part of Spain until September 15th, 1810. There was a Declaration of Independence where California, along with the southwestern states of the United States, um, fought for independence against the colonial power of Spain. And it was only less than 50 years later that we have the gold rush, and then there's an initiation uh, of uh, this new, newly independent territory into the United States. So for me, Celebration of Hispanic heritage is, is a celebration of California and American history. And I believe that that's part of the reason why uh, they've ha had it from uh, September 15th all the way until October 15th. 
uh, not only Mexico, but Central America and South American countries, they declared their independence um, from Spain during the month of September, some in 1810 and some in 1821. So this is the reason why we're celebrating together, and I'm so glad to share my personal history and showing you how it's reflected where we have my father's family crossing the border back in the 50s and 60s, and my dad in the 70s, and then my, my mother's part of the family where the border crossed them. They've stayed put in the same place, but they too are Mexican-Americans. And just, I need to affirm that it's Lat Latino Heritage or Hispanic Heritage Month is not just for Mexicans. It's also for all the Central um, American and Caribbean nations as well as the South American countries, all the countries of Latin America. And we call it Latin America because we have the Latin-based languages uh, spoken in all these territories. So you got your French, you got your Portuguese, and your Spanish. Sorry for making this into a history lesson, but this is where I'm starting because I'm bringing all of me here to celebrate and bless the Lord with you. Okay, let's go to this next one. You probably don't want to know too much about me, but this, if you want to know who I am, this is who I am. 12 years out of high school, I, I studied Hebrew scripture. So you see a big giant Bible on this television. I, being a kid who grew up in the 80s, watched a lot of television. Uh, but also, we, my mom made sure we read our Bibles every single day. But, so we have that big King James family Bible on top of the television. And then there's a picture of my mom. And I don't know if you can see in the back, there's a menorah. It's kind, of, it, it's kind of creepy that I ended up going into Hebrew scripture study, uh, getting a PhD in the Old Testament, uh, the wisdom literature, so book of Job. So here I am, and I'm dancing. This is, the fir this is a typical picture. This is, this is the day in the life of a little, I'm four years old here. I don't know if you knew this, but like back in 1984, we had the Olympics hosted in Los Angeles, and that's where I'm from, and I have a visor from that that has the little Olympics sign on it. And I'm just dancing around, a la D David style, in my underwear. Sorry, you know me way too well now. Um, but here I am, and I love to dance. And that doesn't go over so well in Next slide, please. In a Latino Pentecostal context. <laughs> now, people are allowed to dance in the Holy Spirit, but not dance the way I was dancing. I was just, any, I would go around the house pretending I was either Cindy Lauper or Tina Turner. I love to go dancing around the house. And one day, my mom, she was just fed up. She said, are you dancing in the spirit or are you dancing in the flesh? And I said, spirit, soul, and body, and I just kept on dancing. <laughs> um, can you go to the next one? So, which gives us this idea of what is the soul? What is that? Um, we're going to get into that, but I need to let you know something. Oh, sorry. Can we go back to the spirit, soul, Embody, as a Latina, I was sent a lot of mixed messages. In church, we could dance. There were, in fact, there was this one lady at church who always had this ponytail, and she would get, she'd get dancing in the Holy Spirit, and her ponytail would be kind of like a helicopter, you know? And, of course, we couldn't laugh or anything. We could dance in the Spirit. We could dance to worship the Lord, but we couldn't dance anywhere else. And as a child, going to the swap meet with my mom, and you have cumbias playing with the beats, boom, dum, 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 dum. You know, as a kid, I couldn't stop myself from walking to the beat. And my mom would even get mad in these public spaces. But I was being sent mixed signals, and we couldn't go to our family's birthday parties. My parents had just come to Christ from a, a life of just drugs and alcohol, and they had met at a dance, 
So dancing had other connotations, and we couldn't even spend time with our cousins dancing because my parents didn't want to be associated with that type of life that, they, that the Lord rescued them from, from addiction. And uh, as re recovering alcoholics, they kept us from uh, that space. Um, so I'm very thankful that they did that, but with that, I was missing a part of my identity. And I, let's put that on hold. Let's go to our scripture. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Not only did I grow up in a Latino context, but we shared a neighborhood with an African-American church called Christ Memorial. And the pastor of that church was Benjamin Crouch, who is the father of Andre Crouch. And many times we'd have the Crouch family come to our space to minister to usually the children of the immigrant parents who didn't know Spanish as well as their parents did. And we would sing this hymn, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. Does anybody know that song? Okay, if you know it, let's sing a little bit of it. Bless the Lord, O My Soul, and all that is within me, bless His whole. Thank you for joining in that. Also, within the African-American church and the black church, there was a lot of dancing going on. So church was always a place of dancing for me. But outside of church, at home, it was a little questionable. And I never knew where to introduce my Latinidad or my sense of being a Latina. Like, we'd have choir rallies and some of the choirs would incorporate gospel salsa into the gospel music, um, especially within that church, where as it was predominantly African American in the neighborhood, but during the late 80s, early 90s, there was a rise in Latino population. So during that time, Benjamin Crouch, uh, Andre Crouch's father, passed away. And Andre and Sandra, uh, they ended up having, taking charge of that church after their older brother, ben, Benjamin Jr., passed away. Like, it was weird because his, his father passed away, his, their uh, older sibling, Benjamin Jr., passed away, and Andre and Sandra Crouch, who are these gospel uh, legends, <laughs> they end up with this church in the middle of Pacoima, in the middle of San Fernando Valley, and they co-pastor they don't have, they didn't take an income. Um, but the, here they are in the middle of a, what used to be a predominantly uh, black community, and now they need, they're ministering to not only their black congregants, but a new, a, a new cultural experience of, of ministering to Latinos in their neighborhood. And with that, um, Andre Crouch wrote a gospel song with Salsa Incorporated to celebrate his, his father's um, going home to heaven. And the song is called, We Love It Here. And so it, if you ever want to listen to it, you can go back home and listen to it. All this to say is that even though in sacred spaces we were allowed to dance, and even though in sacred spaces we were allowed to listen to salsa and mariachi and merengue, we were not allowed to dance to it. <laughs> so it's like you could dance in the spirit to these old hymns and you can listen to the music, but don't you dare start shaking your hips in church. And so in the, the message that I received growing up is in order to be a Latino, you have to only engage in your culture so much. That was the message that I got. And sometimes, like looking at church spaces, no matter what culture is, is, is engaging in a sacred space in the United States, it, it's true that... 
Most people have to edit themselves or not bring all the parts of culture into the house of the Lord, into sacred spaces. So when we're, let's look at scripture. And here in the Hebrew, baraki nafshi, bless. It's the command to, specifically to my soul. The psalmist who is writing within the tradition of David is, is commanding his nafshi, or his nefesh, whatever that means, whatever soul is. And specifically, he's saying, bless who? In Hebrew, on the bottom, I'm going to give you a brief little tip. In the Hebrew, it tells you what the direct object is. And it's pointing to the name of the Lord, the name that God gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. So there is no, if there's any doubt in your mind, who needs to be blessed here? It is the tetragrammaton, the consonants, yod, hey, vav, hey, the Lord, I am that I am, that title that God gave to Moses. Okay, so let's break it down. Let's go to the next one. So we hear the word bless, and I think we, I think we, we think we know what the word bless means. Barak is the Hebrew word, and barak means to bless. And we, if you look it up in the, in the dictionary or lexicon from the Hebrew, you're like, okay, whatever blessing means. Okay? So I did a little bit more homework to see what this term really means. What I, what I mean to say is when you, we've inherited so many religious terms in the Bible from the King James that we don't even think to ask any further of, what does that actually mean in English? So when you go to a lexicon, and I'm getting all my information from the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, if you wanted to look that up. When God blesses a human or his creation, what God is doing is declaring that that object or that person is endued with special power. Blessing has to do with power. When we bless God, to declare God, we, what we're doing is we're declaring God to be the source of all special power or the special powers that we experience. In a sense, it is to praise God. In our Western culture, we think of praising God as just boosting up his ego, giving him likes, giving him little heart emojis. But that's not necessarily the case. In an honor and shame culture, what it is, it's giving God that authority to demonstrate that power within that space. In an honor and shame society, giving somebody praise or honor, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> may I have water? <coughs> I'm so sorry. To give somebody honor is to allow them to be themselves. <coughs> In God's case, allowing God to be the source of all special power. Now, let's, now that we know what blessing means, let's move on to the soul. Now this picture right here is modeled after Loteria, which is Mexican bingo. I saw this um, in a gallery at a coffee shop in Denver, Colorado, and I thought it was funny because you have this valise, you have this piece of luggage, but you have, it's labeled as the soul, <laughs> el alma. Usually when we think of our soul, we think of, oh, that's the real person and this body is just the vehicle for the, for the actual person. In our Western mindset, we, we kind of denigrate the body or we dismiss the body. We lessen the value of the body in spiritual matters. And I have this up here not only to share the cultural loteria thing going on here, 
but also to take a step back and say, when we talk about the soul, we usually think that the soul is disconnected from the body or that the body is just a vehicle or a container for the soul. But let's go to what scripture says about it. Let's go to the next slide. What is the soul? Now, concretely, the term is nephesh. It's, this, it's the throat. It's the term for the throat. It, in its concrete meaning, but in its figurative meaning, it's, become, it's used so much, it takes the connotations of the soul in Hebrew scripture. Basic meaning is the windpipe opening for air. It's, or the neck, the throat. But then figuratively, it becomes the breath or the desire of a person. And then later on, it signifies the self or the soul of the person. How did it come to be that something that means throat and windpipe all of a sudden becomes this nebulous idea of a person's animated uh, presence, the thing that animates the person's body? Well, I want to offer you this. It's that idea of the intersection of the physical world and the spiritual world. The first time we ever see the word nephesh is in Genesis chapter 2, when God creates the human person and, there, and he breathes into the nostril and the person becomes a living nephesh. It's the intersection of God's spirit with the human body. That is what the soul means. If we can go back to that picture of the spirit, soul, and body, I think it's like four slides back. Yeah. Right there where it says soul, that part right there, that intersection, it, at least in the Hebrew Bible, that is the idea of the soul. You cannot have a soul without a body. So what does it mean? Thank you so much for doing that. Let's go back to what is the soul. The psalmist is commanding that part of himself, the intersection of his body and his spirit. He's telling that part of himself to bless the Lord. He's asking the intersection of his identity to bless the Lord. And then in the second line, he says, and all that is within me. That's very deceptive. Let's go to the next slide. Because in Hebrew, it literally means his entrañas, his everything that is within me is usually my entrails, my guts. In the Hebrew Bible, the heart was not the place of emotion. It was your guts. The heart was the place of decision-making, place of, of the will, place of the mind. But in the, that culture, in that Hebrew culture, the entrails were the place of emotion. If you fell in love with somebody, they make, you, they make your insides feel things. So it's not to be taken literally, of course, that the psalmist is saying, Bless the Lord, my throat, and my entrails. That would be a literal reading of the Bible, right? But he's not saying that. But culturally, he's saying, bless the Lord at the very intersection of who I am. And everything that I experience in the realm of my emotions. Bless his holy name. Now, in the Spanish language, at least especially in Mexican culture, that's where I'm coming at it, we have something called ganas. Dale ganas, échale ganas. Put, put all of yourself into it. Ganas is, it really doesn't have a one-word translation in English. Tener ganas or echarle ganas, it means to, to have grit, have, have the urge. Um, I don't even know, how, how would you translate ganas? It's like, do it with gusto. You know, I'm trying to describe what, how we use this term, ganas, 
But it's kind of this, a cultural equivalent. What I would see is a cultural equivalent to what the psalmist is saying. Echale ganas. If you're going to praise the Lord, do it with everything that is within you. So that gives us the question of this. What constitutes all of you? What constitutes all of me? Now, I've been challenged over the past two decades that this involves social location, family heritage, culture, race, class, gender. God doesn't want you to check out your identity at the door. He wants everything, all the intersections of who you are to be present. For me, that, the expression of my soul is dancing. It's hard for me to listen to music without moving. I love to sing, but even more than singing, I love to dance. Intrinsic to what it is for me to be myself as Sophia and as a Latina is to dance. And as I said before, that was not always affirmed. There was kind of this idea that if you dance in the spirit, it, it was acceptable because the spirit made you do it. You know, you're like, oh, I'm just dancing to the spirit. But don't you try to bust a move by yourself. Don't try to do it on purpose. Don't try to move on purpose. But what is it saying here? Do it with everything that you are. Do it on purpose. Alrede. Do it on purpose. Bless the Lord with everything that is in you. Over time, though, God has been recovering dance for me in my identity, and I'm using it to bless the Lord. Let's go to the next one. I had to get this picture and embarrass my husband, but this is my picture of just me, my husband, on our wedding day, and my family, at least my side of the family, not his family. Well, my nieces and nephews, up until that point, they had never danced with their grandparents. In fact, like, well, I got married at age 39, so that was three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. And if I had gotten married back in my 20s, there's no way I could have had dancing at my wedding. There is no way that my parents would have allowed that to happen. But by me recovering that part of my culture, first by going and learning how to dance. I had to go to, to the Dominican Republic to learn how to dance. I was 20 years old, and I was on a study abroad uh, program for school. And again, I went into these church spaces. Oh, the music was bumping. It was like salsa, merengue. I was like praise and worship, and I'm like, oh, I can't dance. Okay, yeah, you got to just clap. Okay. Um, but it wasn't until they made us go and learn how to dance that I learned how to be aware of God's divine present, presence in secular spaces, cultural secular spaces. And I started going on this journey from age 20 onward. Now, 20 years later, I'm able to invite my nieces and my nephews to dance with their grandparents, to experience that part of their culture. A year and a half later, or actually, yeah, a year and a half later, my niece turned 15, sorry, go back, please. <laughs> my niece, who's in the front with the red dress, she had a quinceanera. And we had dancing at this quinceanera. And my parents were able to connect or have her connect to her culture and for everyone to dance as a family. So I'm so happy that because the Lord, uh, I've been on this journey of recovering dance as a cultural practice inside and outside of church, that I was able to, to share that. Also, I go to Zumba. I love to dance so much. I go to Zumba and I'm able to connect to people I would never be able to connect to. There was this one lady who's from Syria. 
She thought I was Syrian. I thought she was Mexican. And we're like, hi, how are you doing? And then we're like, oh, you're not Mexican? Oh, you're not Syrian? Oh, ha, ha, ha. Let's just be friends. And so we would dance together. And after time, we have this friendship. And unbeknownst to me, she moved to the Central Valley too. Uh, so I just got reacquainted with her uh, this past month. She's in Visalia and I'm in Fresno. So we, we get to connect again. Um, but I would never have had that deep friendship if it had not been dance. There had, there had not been dance in, in the equation. So let's go to the next one. So what am I doing in Fresno? I'm at Fresno Pacific University. Fresno and the Central Valley is predominantly Latino, predominantly Mexican. And I didn't know this, but Fresno State has competitive flocorico dance, like folklore dance. And they turn people away from auditioning because it's so competitive in the Central Valley. Um, at Fresno Pacific University, where I'm teaching now, I'm teaching undergrads, I'm taking a flocorico class. And, I'm, and the Lord has put it on my heart to just by being by myself that I'm going to be connecting the university to the community. And that would not have happened if I hadn't um, let the Lord take me on this journey of blessing the Lord with my body and in some ways blessing my community by dancing, by being myself, by allowing myself to get rooted back into my heritage. So let's talk about the benefits of God. I'm going to do this. I'm going to highlight two of them, okay? There are a lot. There are lots and lots listed here, but they all revolve around this one scripture, Verse 8, it says, the Lord is merciful, he is gracious, he's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. In verse, in verse 5, well, actually 4, we have the steadfast love and mercy. It first shows up here, but it's all rooted in that declaration in verse 8. So in verse 4, it says, that he redeems your life from the pit. He crowns your head with steadfast love and mercy. Those words are hesed ve'emet. And the first time you ever hear these words declared in the Old Testament is in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. And it's, the psalm is quoting it in verse 8. The Lord, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In Hebrew, it's Adonai, Adonai, Rahum, Vachanun, Erekapayim, Rav Heser Ve'emet. And what that is, is that merc the merciful part, the Rahum part, it comes from the word for womb, Ruchem. God feels the compassion or the pity that a woman has when she decides to keep her unborn fetus has that pity, that compassion, has the hanun of a father, a father who can give favor or can dismiss a child. So what it's saying is the Lord is compassionate like a mother who chooses to keep her child, gracious like a father showing favor instead of dismissing that child. Slow to anger, Erekapayim, it's another figure. It's another image. It's an idiom of having a big nose. <laughs> God has big nostrils, has a big nose. It takes a long time for him to flare his nostrils. That's the idiom. See, again, aren't you glad that you don't have a literal uh, version of the Bible, but you have translators that will take the cultural nuances and make it more palatable for you? Great. Okay. So I wanted to highlight that, that he is slow, he is compassionate like a mother, gracious like a father, slow to an anger, who does not rage like a bull, flaring the, fire, the, the, the heat from his nostrils. 
but abounds in hesed va'emet. Hesed is the key word of the Old Testament. Hesed is the steadfast, loving kindness. Not all love is kind, and not all kindness is love. But he promises this steadfast, this ongoing, covenantal, kind love. And faithfulness. Hesed v'emet. V'emet is and truth or faithfulness. Um, whatever proves itself to be faithful to a person, that's the truth. That's the, the way that the, he, he, the Hebrew people conveyed the language of truth. They weren't out looking for truth up there like uh, the Greeks were. What they considered to be the truth, big T truth, is whatever proved itself to be faithful. And God here promises to be slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Another thing I want to highlight here, another one of God's benefits, is verse 15 through 17. For as mortals, their days are like grass, they flourish like the flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love, again, hesed of the Lord, is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commands. I needed to, I need to go to my notes Because while I was studying and preparing for this today, this is what the Lord put on my heart for you here. That the fragility of life does not take away from its dignity. That sometimes we disregard human life because, well, if if, if all mortals are like grass, here today and gone tomorrow, then that, that might diminish the dignity of their life or the value of their life. But that's not what the scripture says. It it reminds human beings that they are just as created as the grass of the field. And that these verses highlight the fragility of human life. But the, the steadfast love of the Lord is expressed to these, us, frail human beings. So again, I want to reiterate this point. The fragility of life, the frailness of life, does not take away from its dignity in the divine economy. And what I'm reminded of is in Matthew chapter 6, when it talks about not being anxious, but that if God clothes the grass of the field greater than the splendor of with the splendor of that is greater than Solomon's splendor then how much more does he care for you great okay let me get back to can we go back to the previous one so the benefits of God this is a a point that I'd like to when you're reading through this psalm it starts and, and ends with the same command. Bless the Lord, O my soul. What does this mean? That everything in between merits a response of blessing the Lord with everything. The benefit, but I also want to say this. Not only is blessing the Lord with everything that you are the proper and appropriate response to God's benefits, the benefits will not be experienced unless you bring the totality of who you are. Let me read it here because it's probably a little bit more like articulate. I think I was being more articulate here. The benefits of God provoke praise that involves the entirety of a person. To edit oneself is in any way is to miss out on the benefit of God's presence along with the benefits that come with it 
for us individually as well as a community. So I wanted to remind you that God's promise is, well, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament is that he will be with you. And ultimately, Emmanuel, Jesus, is that confirmation of God's promise, God with us. So remember that God's promise is to be with you. But how can you experience the God with you part if you are not fully present with yourself? What, are there any parts of yourself that you feel that you need to edit by being in God's presence? In, and being with the people of God. God is calling us to be fully present. Let's go to the next slide. Estamos aquí. We are here. To be fully present is to be stepping into God's promise. His promised presence. Have people told you that you were too much? That you were extra? What parts of yourselves are you editing? Are you editing out for others? How about God? We sometimes want God to show up for us when we fail to appear for ourselves and others. Today's challenge is to Bless the Lord by being fully present. Bless the Lord with all of your soul, all of the intersections of who you are, spirit, soul, and body, and all that is within you, all your passion, all your desires. I know some of you might be thinking, but not all my passions, not all my desires are godly. What I believe is, as we come to the Lord honestly with the totality of who we are, unedited, it gives the opportunity, it gives God and us the opportunity to connect and to be in the face of our creator is to allow him to love and receive and to burn away all the things that don't matter anymore. To come before the Lord with the totality of who you are. To bless the Lord with all of your soul and all that is within you. It is to allow him to be the source of all special power and ability that you have. And I would like to end this time with a a song that if you would like to dance to it, you can, but you don't, don't feel like you have to. You're like, oh, she talked about dancing, so I guess I'm going to have to dance now. But I'm going to share a, a worship song, and it's done in the style of salsa. And I'm just going to, before our communion time, have you listen to it with what we've discussed in mind. God bless you.
Jesus Christ, that because you lived, you experienced life to its fullest, we can experience the fullness and abundance of life. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. We thank you that you, because you lived and you died, you resurrected, that you have come to redeem all the parts of us, all of our cultures, all of our heritages. I pray, Lord, that we would continue to trust you with the totality of who we are and all of its intersections. Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord, that you, you would remind us during our communion time and during this week that you want all of us, that you want each and every single part, and that each and every single part can be used to bless our families, to bless our communities. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and into our intersectionality, the, our identities, and that we would become extensions of the incarnation of Christ's body here and now. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you, Lord. Bless each person in this room, each family represented. Continue just to revive every single part of us and integrate your spirituality into our humanity. We praise you and we thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.